all three at once. No matter what goes wrong in the economy, whether it's a financial crisis or, or bank failures, whether it's supply chain turmoil or energy market disruption, working people always pay the price. Meanwhile, corporations always somehow find a way to increase their profits. They always find a way. Financial crisis, profits go up. Mass unemployment, profits go up. Global pandemic, profits go up. War in Europe, profits go up. Increasing energy costs, profits go up. When supply chains ground to a halt when Putin invaded Ukraine and the economy reopened and demand surged everywhere at once, everywhere all at once, the rest of us saw problems to solve. But in many corporate boardrooms, executives instead saw an opportunity. For the largest multinational corporations, inflation has been a perfect excuse to increase profits by raising prices far beyond, far beyond the costs of their inputs. The main tool that many in this town look toward to rescue us from inflation, hiking interest rates, can do little to solve that problem. It's a little wonder then that when American workers see the high prices at the grocery store, at the pharmacy counter, at the gas pump, along with rising borrowing costs for mortgages and credit cards and car loans, they remain skeptical of government and its willingness to address the challenges people face. Inflation, of course, is a complex problem. The Fed's been fighting it with a blunt tool, and we've made progress. Inflation is at the lowest level in the last two years, giving hope that the price of consumer goods will continue to decline. And despite the experts' prediction, job growth remains strong. The country added 339,000 new jobs in May. Ohio's unemployment rate, 3.6%, is the state's lowest in 20 years. Unemployment for black and brown Americans remain near remains near historic lows. Think about what actually means for workers in, in, in Alabama and Ohio and North Dakota and Louisiana and Minnesota and South Carolina. Uh, what that actually means for workers all over the country. It means Americans have more opportunity and choice in their lives, even in places they haven't seen a lot of options in recent years. It means people have the power to demand raises and retirement security and paid sick days and control over their schedules. It means more Americans have the dignity of work that comes with a good job that can provide for your family. And look where that kind of power for workers is taking us last month. Wage growth outpaced inflation. That's the way it should be. Today's hearing comes at a critical time. Last week, the Fed decided to pause interest rate hikes after 10 consecutive increases and to maintain the rate at its current level. For the many of us who are concerned that further rate hikes could do more harm than good, it's welcome news. The challenge you face, Chair Powell, is to ensure that workers continue to see higher wages while also continuing to rein in inflation. In previous hearings, you've noted with justifiable pride how careful management of the economy helped millions of workers return to the job market. It's those workers who stand to lose the most if the Fed overdoes its rate hikes, loses sight of the dual mandate, and drives the unemployment rate back up. As you've also noted, Mr. Chair, increasing interest rates is not the only tool we have to fight inflation. The Fed is not the only one with a role to play. Congress, the administration, everyone in government and corporate boardrooms must do their part. There's no reason we can't continue coming together to bring prices down. More policymakers are finally recognizing what those of us in Ohio have known for years, that outsourcing, outsourcing the production of pretty much everything may mean higher profits in the short term, but it won't lead to a resilient economy with a strong middle class in the long term. We've taken steps to strengthen our supply chains in hiring and been bringing critical manufacturing back to the U.S., the CHIPS Act, the bipartisan infrastructure law, a number of things. We must continue that progress instead of lowering demand which is just economics textbook jargon for making people poor, laying off workers, denying raises. Instead of lowering demand, we can produce more, we can build more, we can grow the economy from the middle out. It's also our first semi-annual report from the Fed since the string of bank failures this spring. Those failures were caused by the same issue at the heart of so many of our economic problems. It's the Wall Street business model. Executives lay off workers. They put short-term increases in quarterly profits and their own compensation above everything and everyone else. At, at Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, those in charge pushed their banks to grow too big, too fast. They made risky, prof, mis, risky bets. They got massive profits. Executives were paying themselves bonuses right up until the moment that at least one of these banks crashed. To most Americans, that's not surprising. People have gotten all too used to big bankers treating the industry more like a game or, 
maybe more precisely, an endless ATM for themselves, securing the knowledge they won't pay any real price if things go wrong. Mr. Powell, Mr. Chairman, as, you, as Senator Scott and I teamed up on a 21 to 2 vote yesterday, um, those days for bank executives are over. Chair Powell, I look forward to hearing today how the Fed will protect American workers in the fight against inflation and promote an economy with a strong, growing middle class. Senator, Senator Scott. Thank you, thank you Chairman. Uh, Chair Powell, thanks for joining us today. Such an important time. Your last appearance before this committee was about four months ago, just days before the collapse of two banks. And while we continue to investigate those bank failures, it's important to examine the macro factors such as rising interest rates that contributed to the bank failures and the current economic stresses American families face every single day. Looking through the lens, I want to turn to you in your role as Chairman of the Federal Reserve, a role that requires constant scrutiny because the American people deserve nothing less than the best we can offer them, the greatest opportunity to succeed, and the strongest tools to pave their path. Unfortunately, the bank failures earlier this year shook confidence in our financial system. But thankfully, our healthy and well-managed institutions stepped up and we have been able to weather the storm. However, I've been consistently disappointed in your Deputy Vice Chair of Supervision, Michael Barr. Just yesterday, this committee passed, as Chairman Brown just said, near unanimous legislation to encourage good corporate governance, but not just that, we also wanted to focus on the supervisory failure that was a part of the legislation. Those are not the same actions taken by Michael Barr. I asked him twice when he was here before the committee if he would fire bad bank supervisors for the supervisory neglect that contributed to the epic failures of SVB and Signature. He would not commit to doing anything. And I would ask you in your role as the active executive officer, if you would take some action firing those responsible for missing what was glaringly obvious, now to all of America, certainly should have been obvious to the supervisors. I said from the beginning that this has been a failure in three parts, the SVB and Signature. It was a failure of the bank execs. The action that we took 21 to 2 yesterday reinforces Congress is willing to take the lead and hold bank executives accountable. Second failure was a supervisory failure, and that requires the Fed to hold folks accountable just like Congress did. And third, the Biden inflationary economy that has dr drove prices really high and resulted and 10 rate increases from you all. In the wake of Silicon Valley Bank's downfall, as the, the vice chair released his report on the failures, we heard directly from you that your role was to announce it, to get briefed on it, but not necessarily to be, to be involved in the work of it. So my, my question is, as you watch Vice Chair Barr roll out higher capital standards. It seems like your very clear statements is that you will be supporting as well as working to implement Vice Chair Barr's recommendations. But as you know that the other members of the board, Governor Bowman has recently said that Mr. Barr wrote a report on Silicon Valley Bank's failure that provided his conclusions and went on to state that the report should be used to help guide discussions among policymakers, not necessarily just a rush towards implementation of Vice Chair Barr's recommendations. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that path forward, if in fact your job is to rubber stamp the decisions of Vice Chair Barr, or is your responsibility to take into consideration the Vice Chair's recommendations and then chart a path that seems to be consistent with what is in the best interest of our nation and, frankly, of our financial institutions. I do not believe that increasing significantly the capital standards is in the best interest of small businesses or people looking for loans. The more capital we put on the sidelines, the less capital there is for us to see our financial institutions loaning the money out. I look forward to continuing our discussion during the question and answer time. Uh, thanks, Mr. Scott. Uh, today we'll hear from the Chair of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, on monetary policy in the state of our economy. 
Uh, thank you for your public service, Chair Powell, and uh, please present your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Thank you, Ranking Member Scott and other members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. We at the Fed remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I understand the hardship that high inflation is causing, and we remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve, and without it, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. I'll review the current economic situation and then turn to monetary policy. The U.S. economy slowed significantly last year, and recent indicators suggest that economic activity has continued to expand at a modest pace. Although growth in consumer spending has picked up this year, activity in the housing sector remains weak, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates and slower output growth also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains very tight. Over the first five months of the year, job gains averaged a robust 314,000 jobs per month. The unemployment rate moved up, but it remained low in May at 3.7%. There are some signs that supply and demand in the labor market are coming into better balance. The labor force participation rate has moved up in recent months, especially for individuals aged 25 to 54. Nominal wage growth has shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. While the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still substantially exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Over the 12 months ending in April, total personal consumption, or PCE, prices rose 4.4%, excluding the volatile food and energy categories. Core PCE prices rose 4.7%. In May, the 12-month change in the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, came in at 4.0%, and the change in the core CPI was 5.3%. Inflation has moderated somewhat since the middle of last year, Nonetheless, inflation pressures continue to run high, and the process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. With inflation remaining well above our longer-run goal of 2%, and with labor market conditions remaining tight, the FOMC has significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. We have raised our policy interest rate by five percentage points since early last year, and we've continued to reduce our security holdings at a brisk pace. We've been seeing the effects of our policy tightening on demand in the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy. It will take time, however, for the full effects of monetary restraint to be realized, especially on inflation. The economy is facing headwinds from tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, which are likely to weigh on economic activity, hiring, and inflation. The extent of these effects remains uncertain. In light of how far we have come in tightening policy, the uncertain lags with which monetary policy affects the economy, and potential headwinds from credit tightening, the FOMC decided last week to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at 5 to 5 and a quarter percent and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. Nearly all FOMC participants expect that it will be appropriate to raise interest rates somewhat further by the end of the year. But at last week's meeting, considering how far and how fast we've moved, we judged it prudent to hold the target range steady to allow the committee to assess additional information and its implications for monetary policy. In determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time, we will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of incoming data and their implications for the outlook for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. 
Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below-trend growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for, a, for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the long run. Before concluding, let me briefly address the condition of the banking sector. The U.S. banking system is sound and resilient. As detailed in the box on financial stability in the June monetary policy report, the Federal Reserve, together with the Treasury Department and the FDIC, took decisive action in March to protect the U.S. economy and to strengthen public confidence in our banking system. The recent bank failures, including the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and the resulting bank stress, have highlighted the importance of ensuring that we have the appropriate rules and supervisory practices for banks of this size. We're committed to addressing these vulnerabilities to make for a stronger and more resilient banking system. To conclude, uh, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. Uh, Paul Donovan at UBS has discussed the role that corporate profiteering plays in persistent inflation. While inflation has risen, has fallen from 9%, as you know, it has peaked to 4%. Prices continue to climb because of supply shortages and corporate profiteering, what we're starting to call greedflation. Given that rising interest rates certainly won't solve greedflation, why maintain interest rates at the current level or even consider, as you suggested, raising them again, given the risk of harming the livelihoods of more than a million and a half workers and their families? Mr. Chairman, um, the committee broadly feels that uh, while monetary policy has gotten to an appropriately restrictive level, um, if the economy performs about as expected, that it will be appropriate to raise hikes again this year and perhaps twice. A strong majority of the committee feels that it will be appropriate again, assuming that the economy performs as expected two times before the end of this year. We've come very far, and the reason why we, why we uh, maintained our rate at the last meeting was to give ourselves more time to, to stretch out the time for making these decisions. We moved very quickly at the beginning, and we've gradually slowed down. This is just a continuation of that. Um, but we, we, we are committed to getting inflation under control. And, and uh, the strong majority of the committee feels that we're close, but there's a little further to go with rate hikes. Well, what, um, thank you for that answer. But um, Mr. Chair, what, what Fed governors call cooling down, regular people where I live call them layoffs. Uh, I mean, the question is, why should working families continue to bear the cost of fighting inflation? Why should they lose their jobs so that corporate profits can continue to balloon? Let me move to the next question. Our economy's created 13 million, I'm sorry, it's created 13 million new jobs in the last two and a half years. Black and Latino workers, workers with the lowest incomes have seen the greatest gains in job opportunity and wage growth. What the Fed considers too hot an economy has given these workers their first leg up in decades, if ever. We know that job losses will hurt those same workers the most. How will higher interest rates and the resulting job losses disproportionately impact black and Latino and low-income workers? Well, um, we, we have quite an unusual situation in the labor market where we've had persistently much higher demand for workers than the available supply of workers. So some of the process of getting demand and supply back into into alignment has been taking place through uh, declining job openings and through lower quits rates and through wages that are moving, uh, that are still very high, but, but moving in, into more sustainable levels of increase. So actually, there hasn't been um, a meaningful increase in unemployment. The unemployment rate has bounced around at historically low levels. And that's fine. That, that, that would be the, per the perfect way for this to, to continue to happen. There's no guarantee that will happen. I would just say that it is working families who suffer most directly and quickly from high inflation, and it is for the benefit of those people and all other people that we need to restore 2 percent inflation in this country on a sustained basis. Yeah, thank you. But in the dual mandate suggests that, that those workers, that obviously you look out for those jobs and those workers, but we also know that those workers are the first to be laid off. And I, I would hope that in your next meeting, the Fed recognizes those disparities and, and gives them real weight as you make decisions that, that will likely at some point result in, in more layoffs. Uh, 
probably my last question. Since you last testified in front of this committee, we've had three of the largest, largest bank failures in U.S. history. You alluded, you explored that a bit at the end of your testimony because the executives at those banks failed at Banking 101. Regulators took swift and decisive actions to protect the banking system and depositors. Thank you for that. Um, that's in stark contrast to regulators' supervisory failures in the years before the 08 financial crisis. What actions are you taking today to prevent more bank failures and to make sure banks do real risk management and address liquidity and other basic risks? And I, I, you may in part want to answer. I mean, he can do it himself, but um, Ranking Member Scott's um, comments on, on Vice Chair Barr and where that takes us, but what do, what do you do to make sure banks do real risk management and address liquidity and other basic risks? So I, I would say um, we are committed and I am personally committed to learning the right lessons from what happened in uh, Silicon Valley Bank and the other two failures and implementing, vigorously implementing appropriately. I, th I think there's a clear need to strengthen both supervision and regulation of banks of that size. And I can be uh, going to more specifics uh, in the course of the hearing, but I, I do think we need to learn those lessons, and I think we, we've started to do that. Uh, and it's something, you know, what we saw was uh, an unexpected bank failure overnight led to contagion and, and threatened the broader banking system, and that's not supposed to happen. And uh, we're going we're gonna to take appropriate measures to, to to reduce the chances that something like that would happen. Let, let me follow up briefly on that. The Fed plans to propose an overhaul, as we've talked about, to existing bank capital requirements. So we have a more resilient bank banking sector. Is increasing capital requirements for banks with $100 billion or more in assets to prevent bank future bank failures, is that a strategy the Fed plans to, is willing to deploy to promote financial stability? So we, we've... Uh... We have not come to a, there hasn't been a final proposal. There's been a draft a proposal that's been circulated, but it's, in my understanding, it's not final, and I know things are still moving around a little bit, so I don't really have a final proposal that I can comment on. I do think that the, that the capital increases that, that are getting so much notice are really on, on the larger banks. Uh, there may be also some capital increases in the proposal for, for banks down to $100 billion, but not below that. Um, so... And, and, yeah, and yesterday you said we want to, in particular, the GSIBs, the eight largest banks, to have high levels, very high levels of capital and liquidity. Uh, you stand by that statement? I did, and I, I said, of course, we did spend years raising capital and liquidity standards a great deal on those institutions, and I supported all of that. And, I, and then I, I concluded by saying that further increases, uh, if they are proposed, will, will need to be justified, though, of course, as, as any change in rule would be. Senator Scott? Chairman, let, let's, let's stay with the uh, capital requirements, as you and Chairman were talking about <clears throat> on the larger institutions. But frankly, throughout the entire banking system, uh, pre-financial crisis, capital levels were in the single digits. In the last decade, it seems capital is continually being raised. My question is, how much is too much? And when is enough enough? We are going down a path where something happens or something goes wrong and the only default solution seems to be to raise the capital standards or the capital on the sidelines. And the, the formulas that I use are real simple formulas. The higher the capital standards, the lower the capital for the private sector, which means fewer loans and less capital for those who are actually creating jobs. And so when we have too much capital on the sidelines and we have too little capital for actually creating and producing a vibrant economy. At some point, if you've raised it from single digits uh, just a decade ago during the crisis, pre-crisis, to now, frankly, uh, rumors are as high as 20% for our GSIPs is a possible outcome. How much is too much? Well, that's, I think that's exactly the right question. As you, as you point out, there is a trade-off between making the banks uh, safer, more secure, more resilient. You want them to be very strong, particularly the largest banks, so that they can continue to intermediate and lend money and things like that, continue to function during even stressful situations. But it's with bank capital, it's, it's always going to be a trade-off between the availability and cost of credit and how much safety. And I think that's, that's the question we're going to be addressing and answering as part of this process. As you continue to work on fighting inflation, which I think is job one, one of the another simple formula uh, for for those of us in the, the real world of, of, of business, you know, 
we hear a lot of celebration around the jobs that are being created and the wage growth, but the way I look at it is wage increase minus inflation has led to less spending power. Uh, do you disagree with that? No, I think that's right. Yeah. And so in the end, as we celebrate what seems to be a healthy economy, the truth of the matter is that the average person in our nation today struggles to make their ends meet because of the inflationary impact on their, on their bottom line. And what that means for them is that there's a crisis for a single mother like the one that raised me or seniors on fixed incomes. And, and we have yet to, as a nation, adjust for the 500 basis points increase and how we service our debt. Said differently, the more money we have to use for servicing our debt, the less money we have for meeting the needs of the American people. Therefore, sprinting, uh, printing and spending $4 trillion after COVID was over has led to the inflation that we're seeing. And that, as a result, led to the 10 rate increases. So how do you, as chairman of the Federal Reserve, talk to policymakers about the importance of, of being responsible from a monetary perspective? I know I've seen and heard your comments that that's not your lane, but certainly the actions that we take here impacts, frankly, significantly what you have had to do in order to slow down Biden's absolutely explosive inflation. Let me start by saying that actually you were talking about real wages a moment ago. Yes. Real wages actually did go up at the lower end of the income spectrum, and now they are Bob positive, Quintel. but they're not as positive as, we, as we'd like to see. Them. Yes. So, but to your to your real question, you know, I, I would just say this: that the U.S. federal budget is on an unsustainable path. It has been so for a long time. We need to we need to deal with that sooner or later, and sooner is better than later. That's about, but that's what I can say, you know, and that's what essentially all of my predecessors have, have said. We are not charged with supervising fiscal policy in any way. It's just, but as a, as a high level matter from the standpoint of the economy, that's what I can say. Well, here's, here, here's <clears throat> another analogy that works for me as a former uh, football player, a running back. Uh, if my line isn't blocking and I keep getting my head hammered, I'm going to say something to the line. Uh, at some point, uh, I think it's your responsibility to talk about the importance of fiscal responsibility. That to the side, my last thought and question for you is that uh, SVB suffered because their bond, bond portfolio uh, ended up carrying water uh, in a negative way. You, you have a $8 trillion balance sheet and beyond. Uh, every report that I've read is that your bond portfolio, our bond portfolio, the Fed, is underwater as well. Can you talk to me about uh, the losses that you're experiencing at the Fed from a sure. bond so perspective? Remember that the way, <clears throat> the way it works at the Fed is when we, when we buy assets during QE, yeah, yep. uh, we pay for them with overnight uh, interest rate uh, reserves. And we, for many, many years during the QE era, we've earned a, a spread and we've been sending money to the Treasury way over a trillion dollars since, since QE started. And so now that rates, rates have gone back up to 5%, that process has, re, has reversed. And you know we're, these are paper losses. They have absolutely no effect on our ability to conduct monetary policy or really on the economy. It's, a, it's just a, it's an accounting fact. If we retained capital, then that would be a different, it would look completely different. But we don't. We give all of our profits to the, uh, to the Treasury. So you were giving profits to the Treasury, now you're not. That has an actual effect. I mean, well, if, I, if, mean, I, if I was getting 10 bucks and now I'm not, that there's an effect. Well, the Treasury then will have to, have to borrow money that it doesn't get or raise taxes. It'll have to get the money to, 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 to you know, Correct. To carry out the spending that, that Congress authorizes. Yeah. But that's but not going to really, it's not going to be, in, it, it's not going to affect interest rates and things like that much. Uh, to, to me, I, I have the holistic view of our economy where if, in fact, we have more fewer dollars coming in, which requires us to raise taxes, that in, in the end has a real impact on, on American taxpayers. But thank you. Thank you. Sir Scott, Senator Menendez in New Jersey. Thank you, Chairman. Um, after announcing the rate hike pause last week, you said that inflation has not reacted much to the Fed's past hikes. And I'll admit I'm a bit puzzled by that statement. The Fed's first rate hike was in March of last year, 
when non-core inflation was at 8.6%. It is now 4%. And core inflation has fallen as well. So that sounds like progress to me, especially when you consider that according to the San Francisco Federal Reserve, it can take more than a year for tax rate hikes to take full effect, which means that so far only three of the 10 rate hikes since last year are in full effect. So can you expand a bit more on that statement from last week? What, what progress do you expect to see that you currently aren't seeing? Sure. So uh, you, of course, you're absolutely right. Headline inflation has come down by essentially half, but, but that's largely due to energy prices coming down and commodity prices that go into food coming down. And those are not, I, I won't say that they're not affected at all by monetary policy, but they're principally affected by other things in the economy. You know, the, the uh, war in Ukraine drove energy prices up quite a bit and also food prices. That's not really those things are not principally a function of, of monetary policy, although we probably have some effect at the margin. So we look at, we look at core inflation and we look you know, at how tight the economy is. Um, we are seeing progress, for example, in, in supply chains getting better. That, again, is not really a function of monetary policy. Really where monetary policy takes effect is in the service sector, and, and we, that's where we haven't seen much progress. So, but we are seeing progress in other places, as you point out. Inflation broadly is coming down. But uh, as I said in my remarks, we, we still have a long way to go. Inflation is still running between 4 and 5%. So do you think that the lag period for rate hikes to affect inflation has lengthened, or are rate hikes as a monetary policy tool becoming less effective? I don't think they're becoming less effective, but these are, these are real questions. And, and l the thing with lags is, uh, th this day and age, uh, financial conditions react before we act. So the markets are already pricing in rate hikes. So that's, that's quicker. But the effect of, the, of those financial conditions on the economy still takes time. It, it works very quickly on housing, for example, but less so on the service sector, which is not very interest sensitive. So I, I don't think that that has, has changed. Others have a, have a different view and different directions, they think, in which it's changed. There's also there's not uh, you know, a consensus agreement on how long monetary policy takes to affect the economy. So, some people think a very long time. Some people think right away. So I tend to think, let's look at the middle of that. And you know, a year or and change is uh, um, that's not a, a bad way to look at it. But policy actually started tightening well before that. Before we didn't l raise rates until March, but policy had already tightened substantially before the first um, rate hike in March. Well, I, I I will say I know that you have a dual mandate. You know that as well. The last jobs report shows that unemployment is starting to tick <laughs> upward for women and African Americans. <laughs> So I hope that uh, the, the, the cure is not more consequential than, than what we're trying to achieve. Um, uh, recent reports reported that there's almost $1.5 trillion in commercial mortgages that will come due in the next two years, many of them held by small and regional lenders. With property values declining and interest rates rising, these mortgages could be serious liabilities for many banks. Do you think that we may see some banks fail as these mortgages come due? And if so, what can we do uh, ahead of time to prevent that scenario? So we're, we're, of course, we're spending a lot of time on these issues, and we have been for quite some time. And again, I think you put your finger on it. It's, it's really which banks have concentrations, high concentrations of real estate. <clears throat> and, it's, and that is not seen in the large banks. <clears throat> it's seen in some of the smaller banks. So we've identified those banks. and. There's a supervisory toolkit where, where we work with banks to try to help them resolve those issues by, you know, by raising capital or, or, or uh, you know, dealing with what's happening. And you know, of course, what is happening in the office space nationally? There's an issue with people working from home and just less demand. There's a sort of one-time adjustment going on. There are also some other pockets of commercial real estate where, where there's some softness. So we're working with banks to work our way through this. We're, we're very aware and very focused on the problem. Well, I, I'm concerned that it's a ticking time bomb. Uh, and let me just say that uh, last week you said that commercial real estate risks are unlikely to pose a systemic risk because the loans are broadly spread and mostly held by smaller banks. But how can we ensure that the potential losses in the commercial real estate don't lead to the draining of assets from smaller and mid-sized banks and then create further consolidation in the banking sector that brings us back to, I don't want to be back to 2008 when I was here and was asked to do extraordinary things. 
We certainly don't want to be there either. And um, so we're, we're being pretty proactive about reaching out to these institutions and trying to help them get through these significant issues. Uh, again, it's, it's, rel it's not all smaller banks. It's just some of them have high concentrations in real estate. And it's not in the large banks, which, of course, was where the problem was in 2008 and 2009. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator. Senator Kennedy of Louisiana is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here, Mr. Chairman, and to your colleagues. Thanks to all of you for giving so much to our country. As you know, our fiscal year, our meaning the federal government's fiscal year, begins October 1. We're in the process of putting together a budget. Um, if we pass a budget, we meaning Congress, passes a budget that increases spending by, let's say, 10%, roughly $650 billion. What will be the impact on inflation? So if, if it's, uh, it depends on, uh, if it, of course, if it were funded by tax increases or other spending cuts, uh, I guess in your hypothetical, it's not. It's a de So, I, I, you know, I think deficit spending at the margin stimulates the economy at the margin. It's a big economy, though. And what will be the impact on inflation? It would, it, would be, it would probably be a small effect on inflation ultimately, but there would be an effect through stimulation of the economy uh, between, it would be more demand, which would just in general, I'm not commenting on, I know. I'm, being, I'm sort of commenting on fiscal policy here, but nonetheless, it would be, there would be an effect on inflation. I'm, I'm just asking you about eco, basic economics. Yeah. Um, I, I just read a piece by one of your economists from the San Francisco Fed, Mr. Shapiro, who, who's arguing that uh, labor costs have, have virtually nothing to do with service inflation and a negligible, um, um, is a negligible factor in broader inflation. And I read this stuff from some of your people, and I just wonder what planet they parachuted in from. <laughs> um, if Congress passes a budget, in my prior example, that reduces spending by 10%, roughly $650 billion, what, what impact will that have on inflation? So that would... You know, you'd have less stimulus for demand, and it, you'd be cutting programs if you did that, and, and therefore you'd be slowing the economy down, and the, the impact would be less demand. You, neither, of these, neither of these ideas affects the supply side at all, so less demand would mean less economic activity, less spending, and it, that would have a negative effect well, on inflation. Well, more stimulus by federal spending is inflationary. Is that right? It has a bit, so we've been in this situation where inflation was so stable for 25 years, you remember, and, and almost nothing that we did mattered for inflation. And it, it's called the, the so-called flat Phillips curve, where there just wasn't a connection between how tight the economy is and inflation. That, that does not appear to be the case right now. I think many would, people would say that the Phillips curve is now not so flat and that there is an, there is an interaction between. So that's a, that's a yes. It's, I think that's a yes, yeah. It's, okay. uh, this and is the economics, less, you know. And less, <laughs> less spending by government is, it, it means less stimulus, which tends to be disinflationary. Is that yes. fair? Yes, yes. Okay. Let me ask you about Basel, the Basel III end game. You know what I'm talking about? I do. Um, there's been some reporting... And of course, not everybody has to follow, not every country has to follow the Basel <clears throat> recommendations. We, every, the European Union is not following. Um, they're going their own way, and we're, we're kind of going our own way in America, using the Basel directives as a, as, as a, a, a guidepost. But it's been reported that the Fed's going to uh, raise capital requirements by as much as 20%. Or, excuse me, it's going to raise capital requirements to 20 percent. Is that is that right? No, that's it's it would the, the idea would be to raise them by by 20 percent. In other words, if um, 20 percent of whatever whatever current capital 
requirements are, you would raise it by 20% of the total existing amount. Okay. So, so, if, so if, 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 if J.P. Morgan's capital right, requirement right now is, let's say, 13%, it would go to 15%? Right, something like that, if, mm -hmm. if, we were to, if that were to, to be what happens. And, and uh, um, this will be for banks $100 billion or more? No, no. The, I, in, there, there isn't a final proposal. So, uh, and I know it's still in motion. I know things are still changing. Yeah, so. but you, you, you folks are talking I've been about briefed it, and on you're going to have a lot of input. No, that's right. That's right. So, um, so but, but I will say, um, sorry, what was it, your question was? Are, are you going to raise capital requirements for 20% on, on, to yeah. banks $100 billion or more? Are you going to affect community banks as well? Small no, the, 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 the capital requirements will be very, very skewed to the eight largest banks, the GSIBs. There may be some capital increases for the other banks, and there won't. I don't, I'm not. I think none of this should affect banks under 100 billion. The really big banks, you're talking about. Yes. Are they the ones that are at risk right now? They weren't. They were. They were a source of strength in a in a, in a yeah, place of strength. They're doing pretty well. Term well. Yeah. What we've gone from too big to fail to damn. We're damn happy. They're they're big. <laughs> I mean, haven't we? Well, I, I would say that, uh, as I mentioned, you know, we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort raising the capital standards uh, 10 years ago and r more recently, and I supported all of that and was happy to do so. And I think, I think. Uh, Senator um, Kennedy's time's expired. Senator Smith of Minnesota. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy, <laughs> as you always do, on schedule, on time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member and uh, Chair Powell. Welcome back to Thank the you. committee. Um, so I have a slightly different perspective than Senator Kennedy does on this question of inflation and debt. You know, if, I, I don't think that discretionary spending is the problem when it comes to our federal budget. If you look at it, military and non-defense discretionary spending has hovered at about three percent of GDP for the last thirty years, um, and. In fact, discretionary spending has dis decreased over the last 30 years. So clearly, that is not the problem with what's going on with our, with our debt. It's not what's driving debt growth. The big change is in revenues. So the national debt has increased nearly 100% of GDP because of the Bush and the Trump tax cuts. And without those tax cuts, in other words, if we'd left our tax levels at roughly what they were in the Clinton administration, I mean, which in no way um, restrained economic growth, the budget would only have been significantly out of balance during the Great Recession and during COVID. So Chair Powell, I'm not going to ask you to comment on that because I know you don't like to comment on fiscal policy, but I feel that that's important context for the committee to have as we think about what is um, driving inflation and, um, and what we are doing about it. I have been really struck by how remarkably resilient the labor market has been over the last 16 months or so, which is a good thing as we do the work we want to do to grow the middle class and create more opportunity and more financial security for people. Um, and so rates have risen 10 times, yet unemployment is still near um, historic lows, and wages are growing. Um, now, as you and others have pointed out, real wage growth has been clearly impacted by inflation, which is a real challenge for especially middle class families, working families. Um, although I believe, as you said, Chair Powell, let me just check this, that real wage growth has ticked up um, in the last couple of months. Is that right? Do I have that right? Uh, so at the beginning, it was high real wage, positive real wage growth only at the bottom of the income spectrum. I believe right. now on a 12 month basis that overall wages are moving up faster than inflation. Right. Just right. recently. Right. And so, I mean, I think, you know, clearly we're not there yet. Clearly we have more work to do. I'm encouraged by the progress we've made so far. And I also just want to point out that the significant investments that we have been making in domestic manufacturing and bringing supply chains home and supporting prevailing wage jobs, I think are an important part of this success story, this economic success story, not mitigating the impact and the need to continue to bring inflation back down. So Chair Powell, my question for you is, um, you said last week and you're saying today that while the labor market remains tight, you're seeing signs that labor supply and demand are falling back into sync. Um, do you see a path for inflation to continue slowing without us seeing significant job losses and doing harm to middle class families, working families? 
I do continue to see that path, and you're right. It is the labor market is really the strength of the economy. It's what's driving the economy. It's this very, very strong demand for workers, and and workers are getting jobs, and they're getting paid, and they're spending money, and that's driving demand and and the, the whole thing. But it, and it, it's gradually cooling, and that's that's what we would want to see. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there is a path, and it, I, ideally the 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 means by which demand and supply get back into alignment will involve things like uh, things like the the um, the job openings rate coming down as opposed mm-hmm. to the unemployment rate going up. Mm-hmm. It, although you know, if you look at our forecasts, we do it's not it's not a desired objective, but f- we do expect on this path that the unemployment rate will go up a little further because it is historically low, even at three point seven percent. Uh, you know, until this, uh, the last few years, we really haven't seen that for 50 years. Mm-hmm. So we do think it'll come up a little bit, but ideally most of the, of the, of the loosening will come in the form of, of other, in other ways. Right. And so to the extent that we're able to pursue policies that strengthen the labor market, that contribute to the resiliency of the labor market, it seems as if that should help to uh, mitigate the negative impacts on the labor market that rising um, rates would um, would have because, in effect, what rising rates do is it slowers growth and potentially leads to layoffs. So our part of it is to try to get inflation under control, and um, that's what we're doing. And ideally, we'll do that with, uh, you know, with as little as possible, uh, you know, damage to the economy and the labor market. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. So Smith, Senator Tillis of North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair Powell, thank you for being here. Um, I uh, got a quick question. Yesterday, uh, Governor Cook uh, said in this committee that the Basel Wind Game proposal uh, from the vice chair, she has not had an opportunity to look at it. Now we hear reports that the uh, I think that it's a thousand pages long, probably with a lot of technical information. How much time are the voting principals going to have to fully review and vet this proposal? And is there any expectation that that review would result in any changes, or is it just a matter of them either saying yes or no, they agree with Barr's recommendations? So, you know, I, I would say we will make sure, I will make sure that there's enough time for governors to review the final proposal. We've been we've been briefed on the contents of it, and it's still in motion. Um, there will be a, a proposal that's that comes to the board for approval, and and it, it'll be subject to discussion. And uh, I, it's it's possible there will be further changes before the vote or as a as a result of the vote. But uh, but we'll make sure people have time to review it. As you're going through the review process, uh, <clears throat> do you believe that it would be appropriate to give uh, members of this committee or members of Congress a sort of roadmap for uh, what the recommendations entail uh, prior to moving forward? So I, I think that'll happen, not by, I think that'll happen because um, I think Vice Chair Barr would probably be giving public remarks at some point uh, before the before the meeting. And, uh, and I guess I, I understand now that uh, the head of the FDIC actually gave a speech this morning. I didn't see it, but I know he gave a speech about this subject. Can you explain why uh, comments from Mr. Barr about having a safe and sound banking system square with a banking system that needs additional capital? So that's the, the question is, of course, we spent all those years raising capital for the largest banks. And I think, you know, further increases uh, will have to be justified. And they're you know, they will be. They, we've always known that the Basel III endgame was going to bring some capital increases and bring a discussion about the trade-offs. And you know, there are trade-offs between higher capital, and that's the discussion we're going to be having. And um, we haven't had it yet, but we will. Um, I, I uh, watched your opening testimony in my office. Actually, Gus was there. He says hello. Uh, Chair Powell's met my uh, office dog. But uh, hello back to Gus. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I said he was a good boy. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, you, you've, um, you got me. Um, I, uh, I'm kind of curious about Silicon Valley Bank now. Um, uh, yesterday, we had a, an appropriate hearing and a markup on executive compensation. I voted against it for a couple of reasons. I think we need to work on more tailoring, and I hope as it moves through, we can work in good faith to address some things that would... Uh, 
get me to a yes, but another reason why, uh, uh, one of the concerns I had about that meeting is I think we could pass an executive comp bill and think that we're done with the root causes of Silicon Valley Bank. I, for one, think it was equal parts of management malpractice and supervisory malpractice. Um, so the question I have is who in the Fed is ultimately going to give me a straight answer on uh, what the breakdowns were and the supervisory functions, who those people were, and to the extent that we found less than adequate supervision, what's the disposition of their jobs? Who's that person? Because I ask everybody and they say it's not in their lane. So who is the person that owns me? In the same way that we've mapped the CEO and various members of the bank having made egregious decisions that they should have their compensation clawed back, who can I talk to that says, we've looked at the supervisory process, here were some lapses, they didn't use the optionality of 2155. Uh, we, we now are seeing increased reports of MRAs and MRIAs, so I think there are supervisors out there that are probably understanding Senate Bill 2155 better, but who can answer that question for me? This comes down to uh, a handful of human beings who are responsible for the supervisory functions of SVB. Tough for me to say that something's not in my lane. So. Yeah, <laughs> and I also think tough for Vice Chair Barr. So it is our lane, and, but but I, you know, what? So if I can address what what it is you're you're asking, though, it's I, I would say clearly supervisory failures, and let's not just say San Francisco. It's very much at the board. We are accountable. It's a delegated function. It's it's definitely at the board. We, the buck stops at the board on supervision, not not at the San Francisco Reserve Bank, although they're involved. So we need to learn the lessons, and we need to implement changes. It's not just supervision, though. You know, we need we need to fix uh, liquidity regulation because because of the speed of the of the. It's just a different world, and the old the, the you know the, the 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 regulation for liquidity, the LCR and the NSFR, they're just not adequate to a world where people are are moving money around on their phones like that. So. Um, you know, we're putting, we're doing, so we're doing all of that. I think we're doing it very transparently and rapidly. The, you know, the part, the piece of it that, that uh, you won't be satisfied with is, is we, in public service, people, if they, if they engage in malfeasance, if they conduct criminal behavior, if they break rules and things like that, they get fired. Uh, nothing like that happened here. This was, they, the San Francisco Fed were, they, they had identified the issues. They had notified the the management team that they needed, but it just wasn't forceful enough. And that's a problem with with our system, I think, and the way bank bank regulation is a very kind of uh, procedural oriented thing where you're raising things like that. And we, we need to be able to be nimble and more forceful where appropriate, not every day on every decision, but on where it's appropriate. So that's what I think we're working on now. Well, thank you. And again, thank you. You've been very accessible. I'm going to try and request a meeting after the recess sometime this summer. I would like to get back with you and we'll be submitting questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Tulsa. I, I would add that I don't think that uh, that Congress in 2155 and uh, Barr's predecessor, Mr. Quarles, weakening the rules even more, and frankly, all of you at the Fed in those earlier days and the Congress and the administration in those earlier days are off the hook either for Silicon Valley Bank. Senator Van Hollen of Maryland's recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Powell. Um, I just want to make sure I have a couple observations uh, straight in looking at the most recent report, uh, beginning with uh, wage growth, uh, because throughout the last couple years, uh, we've seen rising wages. We've also seen, of course, rising prices. Uh, but it's been uh, my observation that for lower wage workers, the people who are working paycheck to paycheck, um, real wages are up. In other words, the increase in their wages outpaced the increase in prices they were facing. And your latest report uh, seems to indicate that that trend is actually even more broad-based right now. Could you speak to that? That is right. It, exactly right. At the beginning of the pandemic, the wages went up a great deal for people in those public-facing service jobs that are relatively low paid because that's where the shortages were. and and they, they got positive real wages. And, but that has now spread, I think, overall, uh, on a 12-month basis, you now have wage growth by most measures that's higher than inflation. So real wages going up. Well, that's obviously a good news uh, story for the economy. Let me ask you about labor force participation, because we've also seen um, more people reentering uh, the labor force. Uh, obviously, that uh, helps um, with, you know, 
inflation, wage inflation. Um, and I understand that immigration actually has been an important part of that. Could you speak to the role of immigration um, in, that, in that sense? Sure. So participation has moved up, I think, um, more than we had expected. It didn't move up last year. We were very disappointed. And then now it has moved up. And that's, so that's more people in the labor force. The other thing that's happened, though, is uh, immigration basically went to almost zero during the pandemic. And there's been quite a strong uh, rebound in immigration, and that's creating more people in the workforce. So, one of the we think one of the reasons why businesses are reporting that it's that that labor supply and demand are getting into better balance is because of both participation and immigration. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm still hearing, and I know you are, and it's still a real phenomenon that there are huge um, workforce shortages, uh, especially in healthcare, nursing, all sorts of areas, and. Um, you know, look forward to identifying ways to, to deal with those issues. So just a, a broad question on how you uh, approach uh, the decisions uh, regarding interest rates, and I very much support the decision you and your colleagues made to, to pause uh, the increase in, in interest rates. I understand you're going to continue to monitor the situation. I understand the signaling you've already uh, given regarding the future. But you obviously have uh, a dual mandate. You have mandate to maximize employment. You also have a price stability mandate. But then you also have this other responsibility regarding being a prudential regulator, overseeing the banks, including Silicon Valley, Valley Bank. So my question is this. To what extent did the crash at Silicon Valley Bank, and, and to what extent does continuing concerns uh, about stability in the, in the banking uh, area impact uh, the decisions that you make going forward uh, with respect to interest rates? How is that factoring in? So there's a there's pretty um, substantial research showing that when you have a shock to banking, like the one we had in March, to a sector of the banking industry, that if you come back in six months, you will see lower lending. And it doesn't appear immediately, but it's, it's strong in the data. So we have been saying, we've been waiting uh, to see that, that that does play a part, at least in my thinking, that there may be more, a bit more tightening in the pipeline than, we, than there otherwise would have been. Now, we don't really see evidence of it yet, but then again, we wouldn't expect to see. But it, it's, it, it all points to me in the same direction. We moved very, very quickly when we had to move quickly. We've been slowing down since last December from 75 to 50 to 25 at every meeting, and now we're getting very close, we're at, at least close to where we think our destination is, we th where we think it is, and it only makes common sense to move at a, you know, at a careful pace. We don't want to do more than we have to, but we do think, overwhelmingly people on the committee do think that there's more rate hikes coming, but we want to make them at a, at a pace that allows us to see incoming information so we make good decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman Holland. Uh, Senator Vance is recognized from Ohio. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Chair of Health. Thanks for, for being here. Good to see you. Um, I, I want to sort of pick up on some of the, the questions that uh, Senator Tillis was asking about Basel III and in particular uh, some of the capital requirements and how they affect uh, the regional banking ecosystem in particular. And maybe we can just sort of start with some background um, on, on the Silicon Valley Bank situation just to make sure we're on the, the same page. I suspect we agree on this, but I want to sort of make sure and if not have a discussion about it. So Silicon Valley Bank, uh, I think sort of broadly agree, agree that the reason the bank ultimately cl collapsed is they were way too exposed to long-term interest rate risk because the interest rates went up, uh, their balance sheet deteriorated. That, of course, led to a liquidity crisis, and then the bank was put into receivership. Um, one thing that I've heard a lot of folks talk about, and this is in the context of, of Basel III, but also in other, other contexts as well, is the idea that we need to increase capital requirements in particular on some of the small and medium-sized banks. Of course, if we adopted Basel III, that would, that would happen. But as I understand it, if Silicon Valley Bank, let's say in the years leading up to the crisis, were exposed to higher capital requirements, isn't it plausible that they would have satisfied those higher capital requirements by buying more long-term treasuries? Well, 
it doesn't matter what, what the assets were. You just have to have it's capital is the difference between your assets and your liabilities. Um, if they if they'd had more assets of whatever character, including treasuries, then they would have had more capital. Exactly. So 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 just want to be clear here: if they had bought long term treasuries, not saying they would have done that, but if they had a higher capital requirement and they bought long term treasuries, additional long term treasuries. Uh, that would have, in fact, satisfied the higher capital requirement. In other words, treasuries could have been Tre- used. Treasuries are capital. So, right. Well, no, they're, they're an asset. Or, sorry, they're, treasuries yeah. are an asset. You would have um, had to fund that somehow. So, But the then the follow-up question is, given how, fi- how poor of a job they did in hedging against the long-term interest rate risk, if they had bought more long-term treasuries, do we think their balance sheet would have been in a better or a worse shape? They would have had a bigger loss, and more to the point, they would have still had overwhelmingly uninsured deposits exactly. that were very yep. runnable. Of course. So I, I, I want to sort of the, the point that I'm making, which I'm sure you can kind of understand here, is that capital requirements are not necessarily a panacea to the type of banking run that we saw in the Silicon Valley Bank case. Uh, I think there's a very good argument that higher capital requirements on Silicon Valley Bank would have made the bank run worse, or even you know could, could have made it a, a more catastrophic or an even quicker failure. Um, and, and at the very least, I don't think they would have helped. Do you, do you agree with that? I think there's a lot to, a lot to unpack with Silicon Valley Bank. Of course. Um, and it, it, if you, the thing is, remember, um, it was a capital issue. They were trying to raise capital. That was what was going on. And, and the market was very focused on their portfolio losses, which were highlighted by the fact that they tried to raise capital. And so there was a capital issue there. Now, you're right, if you had filled the capital hole by... But you have to retain earnings or or raise it or get some new equity. And if you just use that to buy treasuries, then, yeah, it wouldn't have made things better. Yeah. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so one one just final question I have just really is about the, the operation of the Fed here. And, you know, we've talked about this privately. I've talked about this a lot on this committee. I know the chairman uh, shares this concern. Uh, you know, we have a lot of mid-tier banks in the state of Ohio, and I think that that mid-tier, that three-tier banking ecosystem is really, really important. Uh, Huntington Bank in Columbus, Ohio, I believe, is the single largest SBA lender. If you look at the commercial and small business lending, a lot of it's being done by the mid-tier banks, and I feel like they're they're facing a lot of pressure um, from from regulators and and just in their business model because you, they have seen some flight of deposits away from them and towards the larger banks. So I really worry about the the potential problems we're creating for these banks from both a regulatory uh, and a business model perspective. But I I wonder, Chairman Powell, do you guys have meaning at the Federal Reserve? Do you guys have a standardized approach where you try to understand the capital cost of each tier of our banking system? Uh, is that something you don't concern yourself with, but or, or, or is it? No, we're we definitely concern ourselves with that. Okay, you know we all of us, and I, I'll just speak for myself, really believe that we're lucky to have such a diverse group of institutions from the community banks through the smaller regionals, the big regionals. That's a great feature of America and, our, and of our economy because they, they, you know, they're just important in their own ways. So we try hard yeah. not to do a one-size-fits-all thing. Of course. I, I, if I can, just, just one more final question here, um, Mr. Chairman. I, do you have a good sense of what the capital cost is for the biggest banks, the sort of systemically important banks, versus the mid-tier banks? Like, what, what is the capital cost difference, broadly speaking, do you – Maybe we'll follow up on on, on, on a, in a written question, but I'm very sort of I'm very curious about how you guys think about that different capital costs because it informs a lot of the policy we make. Thank you. I'd be happy to have that conversation. Appreciate it. Thanks, Senator Vance. Uh, Senator Fetterman of Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Powell, sincerely, thank you for being here today. And first and foremost, I I believe that the Fed must make sure that we have an economy that truly works for working families. I suspect you would agree. And the reality is that the tool of cooling the economy with interest hike, uh, hikes can push people out of jobs. We want to drive down inflation, of course, that makes sense. But we don't want to hurt working people to, to suffer. You know, how do you kind of square that together? Because it's quite a paradox. So. It's working people who are, who are the most hurt by inflation. It is a bit of a paradox, I would agree. Um, 
if you're living on a, on well, quite a, the a, paradox, exactly. You're absolutely it right. Is. Yeah. No, so uh, if you're living on a fixed income and you're spending every dollar on on necessities of life, transportation, yeah. fuel, food, clothing, and inflation goes up, you're in trouble right away. You don't have a, a safety net. You're not a middle class or upper, you know, wealthier person. So it is for those people that we need to get inflation under control. It is also the case, though, that the way we, the tool that we have, and we are the organization that's charged with price stability, is to cool off demand so that demand and supply get into better uh, alignment over time. And we, 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 of course, would love to do that in the current situation with as little uh, effect on the labor market as, as we can. And much, there's much cooling that can take off in the labor market that doesn't involve higher unemployment. However, I can't guarantee that restoring price stability wouldn't have some implications of a higher unemployment, but you have to think that restoring price stability will pay, will pay benefits to everybody, especially uh, low and moderate income people for decades. Yeah. Th thank you. No, and, and I agree. It, it's just such a paradox because you um, have a dual mandate. And now we're going to kind of uh, change the gears. It's clear that inflation over the last years have been many causes. It includes rampant corporate price gouging and monopolies. While Americans have gotten ripped off, executives and shareholders have raked in record profits. It's deeply immoral. I understand that it's not the policing pre price gouging and not in the Fred's directory, but you might, you might look at smart ways to fight inflation. Is it fair to, to say that big business have been jacking up their prices and way more than their costs have increased? Is that, is that accurate? So I think, I think what happens, what's happened during the pandemic was um, supply was constricted. Cars is a great example. So the demand for cars went through the roof because people didn't want to take public transportation. And rates were very low, so demand was just very, very high. And we couldn't make cars. The, the literally, uh, production of cars went down because there weren't enough semiconductors. I mean, I personally didn't realize that you needed a lot of semiconductors in a car, but now everybody knows that. So. So what happened was, how do you decide who gets the car? So the prices went up a lot. Car prices went up because when there's a lot of supply and restricted, a lot of demand and restricted supply, you get higher prices. As the economy returns to normal function and we have more semiconductors now, supply chains are getting better, what's happening is pro corporate profit margins are coming back down, as you would expect. And, and so that, that's just the way the economy is working. So, so is it fair to say that you don't believe that price gouging wasn't a, a factor? I, well, I, so I think that the, the collision between very strong demand and limited supply was, was a big factor, particularly as it relates to goods inflation. It, it's not much of a factor as it relates to housing services inflation or services inflation, which account for about three quarters of, of inflation. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Ceding the, the time back to the chairman. Thanks, Thank you, Senator Federman. Senator Daines of Montana is recognized. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Powell, good to have you here this morning. In uh, Montana, as well as the Mountain West, <clears throat> inflation remains above 5%. In fact, we're higher than any other region in the nation, whether it's gas stations, grocery stores, increasing prices, and its real-life impacts remain truly a top-of-mind and daily issue for Montanans. With inflation remaining stubbornly high, I can't help but reflect on the warning signs that were ignored by my colleagues across the aisle while they raced to push through trillions of dollars in partisan spending disguised as COVID relief and now the American people are bearing the brunt of this reckless spending. In fact, for the average American, unless you've received a nearly 16% pay raise over the past two years, you've effectively received a pay cut. Chair Powell, I, I urge you and the Fed to remain vigilant and steadfast in your effort to rein in inflation for the sake of all Americans. Unfortunately, record high inflation is not the only crisis the Fed is having to navigate. While bank regulators were more focused on climate change than actually regulating the banks under their supervision, several coastal banks collapsed and caused panic across the banking sector. Before the dust even settled, 
Several of my colleagues across the aisle immediately began calling for increased regulations and greater capital requirements for banks with little appreciation for the negative impacts these changes would have on small and mid-sized banks across the country. I've heard from community banks across Montana who are justifiably concerned that they will be wrongfully punished for the actions of a few poorly regulated and poorly managed banks. You mentioned several times your testimony yesterday and again here today that the U.S. banks remain strong and well capitalized. Chair Powell, if banks are so well capitalized, why the urgency now to increase capital requirements that would really prevent another Silicon Valley bank? Well, let me say first that the I think that we don't have a final proposal to talk about yet. When we do, we'll be able to talk much more specifically about it. But um, the for, for community banks and banks, any banks under $100 billion, this is, I, I don't think they're going to be part of this proposal. So we're really talking about principally the very largest banks, the GSIBs, and to a lesser extent, uh, the banks, uh, the, the, the regionals, and then the banks between 100 and 250. And yes, the right question. We... Um, you know, the question is, is, is more capital the answer? And we'll be addressing that. We'll be, we'll be making a proposal. We'll be soliciting public comment on that. Uh, I'm well aware that there's a trade-off here. More, more, bank, more capital means more stable banks. It means stronger banks. But there's also a trade-off there. And with capital, you've, you've got to make a, a judgment about where you draw that line. Yeah, and then to that point, um, increasing the capital requirements uh, could in turn decrease lending. Um, will the impact this have um, on small businesses who may not be able to get a loan be taken into account before you finalize a proposal? Yes. I mean, the thing is, st stronger capital means banks will be able to continue to lend during difficult times, too, right? So that's, that's why we do it, uh, is for those stressful times. But it, it is a judgment call, and a lot of, there's a lot of science and arithmetic that goes into it, but ultimately deciding how high to go is uh, is is a, a challenging question, and we're so we're going to be making a proposal, and and I'll personally be listening carefully to the uh, to the comments. You you uh, alluded to um, focus more on the GSIBs um, and trying to spare the smaller banks perhaps from the impact. Um, and I realize the proposal is still being developed, is not uh, finally baked yet. But uh, are you prepared to commit to? sparing the smaller community banks from changes the Fed might propose on capital requirements? So I, let me say, I, uh, my understanding is that the proposal doesn't affect banks under $100 billion, and I would have serious questions as to why it would. And particularly, most community banks, for example, in, in your state, are, are much smaller than $100 billion, and I don't know why we would be looking at their capital. They're, they're, they're generally quite well capitalized. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to the, on inflation back to that earlier statement. I appreciate the wait and see approach the FMOC took at its most recent meeting. But as I noted in my remarks, inflation does remain stubbornly high, particularly in the Mountain West, and labor markets remain as tight as we've ever seen. It was noted, however, that the committee is poised to continue raising rates later this year. My final question can you expand just a bit more on your outlook for the rest of the year? and speak to your continued commitment to do whatever is necessary to bring inflation back to your 2% target. Yes, so I think um, if you look at the committee's forecasts, uh, and mine are very similar, we expect modest growth going forward, growth in the, in the you know, below the, the sort of longer run growth rate of the United States economy, which is around 2% or a little bit less, growth lower than that. And we expect uh, the labor market to continue to gradually cool off. And with that, there's an expectation that inflation will continue to move down later this year. And if, if things happen that are sort of broadly in keeping with that, the strong majority of the committee believes that it will be appropriate to raise the federal funds rate again once or twice by the end of the year. A strong majority came down on twice between now and the end of the year. So. Um, I think the data will tell us what to do. I think the point of our meeting, the last meeting, was really to moderate the pace of our decision-making on this because, you know, it, it was very important to move quickly last year, and we did. 
it's not so important now because we've come so far and we're relatively close, we think, to where we, where we need to get. But we will, I mean, people should believe, and, and broadly speaking, the data show that they do believe, that we will do what it takes to get inflation down to 2% over time. Thank you. Senator Haggerty from Tennessee is recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Powell, good to see you again. I'd like to start with something that uh, has troubled me since uh, our hearing yesterday regarding the Basel III in-game proposal that's coming forward by Vice Chair Barr. Um, the proposal is going to have far-reaching ramifications, I think. It's rumored to have over a thousand pages in it. Yet when I asked uh, Governor Cook about the proposal uh, yesterday, she told me she hadn't seen it, has not reviewed it. And my understanding is that the agencies, including the Fed, are due to vote on this on the 18th of July. And given the fact, and I think Senator Warner described it aptly yesterday, the potential for a perfect storm here. If the rumors that we're hearing about capital uh, requirement increases uh, that may be proposed are true, um, this may come at a time, banks may be preparing for a capital increase at a time when we absolutely need banks to be lending, not constraining lending by raising capital requirements. So I think there are numerous analyses, the impacts on the small business community, on the banking system need to be taken into account. And I'm very concerned, particularly in light of, um, of Governor Cook's response, that she had not reviewed it, hasn't seen it, and, and didn't seem to have any um, you know, perspective on it at this point in time. It's a very short window to undertake a decision on something as complex as, as we may be talking about with over 1,000 pages in this report. So my, my question of you is, how will this process be managed at the Fed in terms of the decision making and the analyses that need to take place? So. I'll, I'll make sure that governors have enough time to carefully evaluate this. So the staff has been briefing governors, um, uh, you know, for the for the past few weeks about what. The, but the, but the, the proposal is still evolving, though. You're still. I mean, I, I'm hearing as, even as recently as this morning, things are moving still. So it's it's not possible when you say we haven't seen it. We have not seen a final proposal. There isn't something to send to the committee, and I think. You know, you, you can be briefed on the current state of where things are, and I have been in, in detail, but ultimately, you know, when you sit down to read this, this large document, it'll, we were gonna, I'm going to wait for the final version to really do that. But you're, you're right to point to the, uh, the need for time to evaluate it. Yeah, Governor Cook's response to me, as she deflected yesterday, just left me with a great concern. So I appreciate it. I just see no need to rush here, given the significance of, of what's happening. And frankly, uh, the, 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 the other concerns you and I have discussed in terms of, of where we are today, I think it, it, it warrants every you know, very deep consideration. I'd like to turn to another item that you and I have also discussed in the past, uh, Mr. Chairman, and that has to do with bank mergers. And if you think about uh, a potential bank that's in distress, all things being equal, would we be better off for that bank, that distressed bank, to undertake a merger or acquisition, or would we be better off to let it enter into receivership? The former. Certainly. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, yet we also, in the case of First Republic Bank, uh, it was like a slow-moving train. Stock price had collapsed. There were actually, in my understanding, 11 different financial institutions that put forward proposals that would have you know, been a rescue package for the bank, yet none, were, uh, none went far enough to, to achieve an actual merger or an acquisition in that place. In fact, they let it go into receivership. And you know, my concern is that this administration has created such a negative environment for consolidations that uh, it, it's, it's a real issue. My question of you is, do you think the current state we are, should we allow more banks to merge, uh, especially given the stress that we're seeing in the system? So I think there was, there was every chance given for and, and much hope bestowed on the idea of, of having that bank sold before it went into receivership. It just, they couldn't, they couldn't make it happen. And that, that's unfortunate. Everyone would have loved to see that outcome rather than a receivership. No one I'm wanted that to be the case. I'm certainly in that camp as yeah. well. Um, yeah, my, my view is that there's, a, there's an environment right now of uncertainty. As, as the banking community looks at uh, mergers and acquisitions in, the, the, in, in the, um, the, the guidance that the White House has given about you know, very negative in terms of mergers and acquisitions uh, against consolidations, I think that um, institutions are very reticent to move forward. And that's why I've introduced the Depositor Protection Act, which among its many provisions, it's going to provide a green light to well-capitalized, well-rated banks to merge with institutions that are under distress without having regulatory interference. And so as the committee moves forward, I hope that we're going to have opportunity to work on this legislation. I hope we can remove 
needless regulatory hurdles and hope we can actually encourage mergers and acquisitions that will protect taxpayers. Um, one, one final point I'd like to raise with you, Mr. Chair, it's something that you identified uh, nearly a decade ago. Uh, at that point in time, the Fed created a reverse, reverse repurchase facility that was intended to be a tool that would put a floor on interest rates. Uh, the facility was targeted at investment vehicles like money market funds, which actually play a significant role in the short-term funding markets. At that time, you joined others in the board in expressing concern about the possible unintended consequences of this facility, particularly in times of market stress. That's where this facility could actually exacerbate the so-called flight to safety. Since that time, this facility has grown to over $2 trillion worth of overnight deposits at the Fed. Mm -hmm. So I'd love for you to walk us through, if you might, the potential risks that this facility might pose and you know, take us through how it relates to basically pulling deposits out of the banking system at a time when we'd like to retain those deposits. So the, the um, reverse repo facility really hasn't increased. In fact, it's shrunk in size since the events of March. So it's really not on net accounting for the decline in deposits. Really what's happening there is that um, market rates are higher than deposit rates and depositors are, are moving their money. This happens in every, in every cycle. I think the uh, I raise it up for just a moment, please, Mr. Chairman. So, are my numbers incorrect that we now have two trillion dollars that are parked in this facility by money market? We funds? had two and a half trillion before March, so it's come down in size. In fact, now that Treasury is is refilling the now that their the debt ceiling is solved and they're refilling the Treasury General account, the reverse repo facility has been declining, and that's that's what we would have hoped to see uh, rather than taking reserves out of the system. Still thank thank you, Senator Agri. Uh, Senator Warren's great Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, the challenge of coming a bit late, you kind of asked my question, <laughs> but Chairman, great to see you again. Um, I'm going to at least ask a variation on it. Uh, of the same question I think a number of members have asked, and you know, I know a lot of us are, are sometimes get the advantage of being Monday morning quarterbacks on how you navigate through monetary policy. I think you've um, generally done a pretty good job. I'm very grateful that you're on a pause. I hope that pause, that, as the data comes through, continues. But we definitely have some stresses with that monetary policy. Um, secondly, you, you are doing what, again, I think people on both sides of the aisle have called for in terms of quantitative tightening. Um, and again, that doesn't have the immediate effect uh, that um, the monetary policy has. But as we've discussed, and I think Senator Haggerty raised, we also have you know, the appropriate review that Vice Chair or, or Barr, Barr for Supervision is doing on capital standards. And I think Senator Haggerty and my staff told me even used the term I was going to use of perfect storm of these three all coming together. I borrowed your term from yesterday and, and, and properly, properly acknowledged that, <laughs> Senator Warner. I'll, I'll call it very stressful situation. <laughs> and I understand, I think yeah, you pointed out to my friend from Tennessee, you know, the capital requirements will phase in, but, you know, you could have all three of these events come together. I think you've addressed this already, but I just want to add my voice to that concern. Um, Safety and soundness, you've got a lot of jobs, safety and soundness, I inflation control, and full employment. That full employment piece uh, is, could be affected by this potential perfect storm. And again, I hope all of your colleagues, I raised this with the, the other members, the, the nominees for the Fed yesterday, uh, and I hope you will, and again, uh, I think you've been asked in the House, you've been asked here. Uh, I don't know if you've got anything else you want to add to what you've already responded on that. But. I'll just say we, you know, it's you're right. That's we're thinking very much about that. Um, fortunately, it's been orderly. The you know the the uh, shrinkage of the balance sheet has been quite orderly. There's still a very very high level of cash reserves in the system, and we don't think they'll be scarce anytime soon. Uh, we think the the refilling of the Treasury General account that was people have been focused on that for a couple of months. So far, early days. That seems to be going well. We're watching it very carefully. But again, and, and you know, it's easy to sometimes sit up here and attack rather than manage all th three of these, but there could be this moment in time where these factors all come together um, that could have a really negative effect on the economy. Let me, let me move to, um, I think, something I think that's not been raised. Uh, I have huge concerns. Uh, you know, we've all litigated back and forth 
causation on SVB. But one of the things that happened when you get, you know, 40 plus billion dollars coming out of an institution in six hours driven by an internet based run, um, that is, you know, I don't know what regulatory framework prevents that. And, and while I was glad that the, the SEC Chair Gensler put out a commentary that's saying, you know, we do need to take a look on um, more transparency on short selling. You know, we're not, you know, we've found in the past short selling bars themselves don't prevent some of this. Um, one of the things that uh, a New York Fed official mentioned is how do we get rid of the stigma of a bank going, um, you know, to the, to the window? I mean, the, the, the thing is, rather than Fed being lender always of last resort, you know, if, if we have that liquidity window, it's available. Banks are reluctant to use it, but in an era where people can move capital so quickly, having that liquidity tool available and not taking a huge amount of hits for using it would seem to me to be something that would, could at least take on this question of these internet-driven runs, which so far I've not heard from anybody on either sides of the aisle a really good suggestion, including I've thrown out a lot of suggestions that frankly, after a point of reflection, I'm not sure make that much sense. But this liquidity tool of using the window, the Fed discount window, you know, is there a way to think about getting rid of the stigma? And maybe we as policymakers ought to make that point as well. But could you address that? Well, it's, so it's, it's critically important that people be able to use and willing to use the, the discount window and also the bank term funding facility, other facilities that we set up, and, and that they aren't marked down by the markets for, for doing that. And so- And or marked down by the regulators or the examiners. Yeah. Um, but the, the concern is that markets will see this, and you know. So I, I would say the first thing is do no harm, and that is, you know, we uh, the Dodd Frank provided disclosure of names and things like that at a, at a quicker pace. That's one of the reasons banks don't want to do this is they know their names coming. Just don't. I wouldn't bring that. I think whenever you look at changing that disclosure around use of these facilities or or that, you should be really consider that you're going to make the stigma worse. I actually think it's good that banks have been willing to use the the uh, discount window and, and the new facility during this crisis. And it's it's almost like the stigma is a little bit less than it was. I, I want to think that anyway. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto of Nevada's next. Um, two Republicans in a row I called on. So Senator Britt, you will be after Senator Cortez Masto of Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Powell, it's great to see you again. Thank you. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, yesterday, uh, I think Senator Warner mentioned this, we had um, uh, hearings for nominees to the Federal Reserve, and one of the nominees is the first Hispanic uh, to sit on the Federal Reserve, Dr. Adriana Kugler, who has extensive experience economically as well as uh, including congressionally confirmed positions. I'm looking forward uh, to supporting her confirmation as well. Let me let, let me talk to you a little bit um, about um, uh, tougher lending standards that might be affecting inflation uh, as interest rates increase. Yesterday, uh, Rafael Bostic, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, published a blog post noting that the tightening bank lending standards we see are directly due to the Federal Reserve's higher interest rates. Do you think that the credit tightening we see from regional banks is acting as an effective substitute uh, to an additional interest rate hike? It, it may be. We've been looking for that. We actually don't see a lot of evidence of additional tightening on top of what we have had already been seeing yet, but, but we're, we're keeping our eyes out for that. And so then <clears throat> what, what are some risks if the FOMC continues to raise interest rates to, despite seeing the impact of these rate increases already resulting in more credit tightening and higher housing costs? And we talked a little bit about this. So, the, you know, the, um, the risk is that we... The reason we've slowed down, really since last December, we slowed from 75 to 50 basis points per meeting to 25 at every meeting. And now as we reach, as we get closer and closer to what we believe will be our, our it's uncertain, but we, we're, we think our destination is we've, we've slowed down a little further. So we're trying to avoid the mistake of going too far. Um, and that, that's all it is. It's, it's, um, and as you can see, overwhelmingly, uh, People on the committee do believe that will be it will be appropriate to raise hikes one or two additional times. A strong majority believes two times this year if the economy performs as expected. Thank you. And and so let, let's I'm going to jump to um, employment, and this is something I talked about yesterday as well because 
uh, Nevada has this sort of workforce paradox. Uh, it, the most recent data shows that in Nevada, um, with both the biggest increase in job growth and the highest unemployment rate, um, it, 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 I want to get your thoughts on um, moving forward uh, as we address this concern, this paradox. Let, just let me give you an example. Nevada has the largest percent increase in employment, which was 4.2%. We also had the highest unemployment rate in the nation in April at 5.4%. Two, that's two points above uh, the national rate. As you consider the Federal Reserve's mandate to keep unemployment levels low, how do you consider states like Nevada where there is that paradox? So we, we only have the one federal funds rate. We really can't. We have to look at the national level, although we do, we, we're well aware of different labor markets and, and also interest, other interesting characteristics in Nevada. Well, and we've talked about this because the labor market, particularly in the service industry, has been a drag, and we've seen that in Nevada. And you and I have talked about this as well. Is that something you consider as you look at uh, the, the numbers, particularly in the service industry, and what are you seeing? So we're still we're seeing in the um, service industry is really where we still see labor shortage. You, you still have a very high level a number of job openings compared to the number of unemployed people. And I think even in Nevada, you, you've got a, a job openings ratio to unemployed of 1.4 or something like that. That was unheard of before the before this this period of time. And that just means there's still tremendous demand. And, it, and it, in, of course, in Nevada, it would largely be in, you know, travel and entertainment sector, I, I would into it. And then talk about the housing data, if you would. It's another conversation we had and how much of a drag that is on the economy as well and what you're seeing. So, that, you know, housing is very interest, uh, interest sensitive spending. You know, mortgage, mortgage rates are, uh, are very sensitive to our policies and, and housing construction and housing sales and things like that are very sensitive to mortgage rates. So you saw, you saw, um, uh, housing activity moved down pretty significantly when we started raising rates. You've actually seen it kind of hit a bottom now. We actually met, we met with some uh, with a housing group manufacturers, housing uh, builders yesterday, and they say business is pretty good. It's largely new entrants, though. People, many people have low low rate mortgages that they're not eager to get out of, and it, so the the sort of strength you see now is new buyers coming into the market. So the market seems to be improving. Um, but again, in, it, it's the most interest sensitive uh, spending or among the most interest sensitive. So it's going to be affected when we tighten policy. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Uh, Senator Brett of Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by acknowledging the strength of the U.S. banking sector. In recent events that unfolded related to SVB, Signature, and First Republic, it highlighted the significant consequences that could occur when bank execs prioritize profits over risk management, and also when banking regulators fail to do their job. Regulators left numerous red flags unaddressed, which allowed the inexcusable risk management practices at these banks to continue for as long as they did. Let's be clear. This inaction played a significant role in these banks' ultimate demise. However, the mismanagement and excessive risk-taking that occurred within these institutions are not representative of the broader banking sector. In fact, I think it's quite contrary. Banks across the board have proven to be resilient, well-capitalized, and a source of strength in the global economy. In fact, I think... Um, you see that the U.S., comprised of banks of all sizes, is the world's most dynamic banking system. I'm concerned, though, with impending actions of the Federal Reserve that that in itself will be jeopardized. If you look, um, community banks, for instance, have served our individuals in our small and rural communities across not only my great state of Alabama, but across our entire country in ways that have allowed individuals and small businesses to actually be able to achieve the American dream and to thrive. However, over the past decade, we've seen a significant decline in the number of community banks serving Americans. The U.S. has lost 71% of total banks in the last four decades, and unfortunately, smaller banks have made up a large portion of this. 
And just in the last decade, the number of community banks dropped by nearly 40%. That is completely and totally unacceptable. When we look at the vital role that they play in each and every one of our communities, we have to make sure that that strength is maintained and not undercut. In the face of these declining numbers, the Federal Reserve is considering proposals that could further contribute to the decrease in small and mid-sized banks. Chair Powell, as the Fed is considering changes to the current banking regulatory framework, including stricter capital requirements that Vice Chair Barr has advocated for, how is the Federal Reserve evaluating the downstream impact of these on our smaller community banks? So I think community banks, when we think, we think of community banks, we think $10 billion and under mainly, but in assets. Uh, but I, I don't think under $100 billion, I don't think the proposals that are under consideration are really a, applying to those banks. So I think that it's not, it shouldn't be a factor for smaller institutions, which, as you point out, have been declining in number for 30 years. So what do we do to support them? From your perspective, what is the Fed doing to support community banks and rural banks or creating conditions where they can thrive? So there, there are these secular forces that are driving consolidated interstate banking and also just population moving out. Of, you, you see rural areas that have lost half their population, things like that. So we, we can't do much about that. But the piece of it that we can, we, we understand that declining numbers of community banks is not a good thing for the country. The country isn't better off for that happening. And so we want to be, we don't want to be part of the problem. And part of that can just be once, once fit size regulation, you know, high fixed costs, it, it, it will make even small bank, especially small bank models, unprofitable. So we very much try hard to, to not be part of the problem and to, and we do as an institution very much understand how important community banks are for the economy. Can you speak to that? Can you tell me what role you believe community banks play that maybe other institutions cannot? So community banks are in their communities, so they, they, they know the community well and they know the people in the community and the businesses in the community and and uh relationship lenders it's relationship lending yeah it's not um I, I told a story yesterday which happened to me we were we were moving to washington and we had a this big bank wanted to make the loan and they decided not to make the loan at the last minute i called the local community bank they, the loan officer was somebody that knew my family they knew the house he went to my high school he was much younger of course but, and they made the loan very quickly with, and, and they just understood it. It was going to be a great loan. We paid it off long ago. So I, I understand personally that they're better at, at doing certain things. The, the big banks do some, certain things very well, but they don't do that very well. And, and for smaller just, businesses. Absolutely. And just want your commitment that you'll continue to take a look. Um, whatever type of um, additional regular, regulating or regulation tools that are kind of perceived to be helpful to maybe some of the bigger issues that we take a look at how they affect downstream, how they affect small banks, mid-sized banks, and that we make sure that we create conditions where they can flourish. Yes, you very much have my commitment on that. Thank you so much. Thanks, Senator Britton. Rest assured, one of the, um, well, best after yesterday, maybe not, but one of the few things that both sides feel strongly and agree on here is that uh, that community banks play a major, major role in, in our financial system, and all of us support the community banks in our communities and know how important they are. So thank you for your comments. Uh, Senator Tester is recognized from his office. Yeah, thank you, Chairman Brown, and, and, and thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for being in front of the committee. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, look, when I talk to Montanans, I hear about what I think everybody in the committee hears about. They hear about inflation, hear about the high cost of housing, you constantly hear about unaffordable child care. Uh, and, and all these are economic conditions that impact hardworking families and small businesses and, and communities across uh, my great state. And, and the examples are clear. Hospitals can't hire nurses. Schools can't hire teachers. And if they can't hire them, there's no place to live. And even if they can find a place to live, then finding child care is a problem. And then paying for that child care is a problem, too. Unfortunately, we haven't done much about any of those uh, from a congressional standpoint, but I think all these challenges need to be addressed. But I'm talking to the chairman of the Fed. And so when I ask the chairman of the Fed, when we talk about these issues of inflation and housing and child care, does the, I know you guys think about inflation, uh, but do you think about the other things and do you have tools to address things like housing and child care or is that simply out of your purview? 
We, um, we, you know, we, we enforce some of the consumer protection laws and, uh, you know, we, we, so we can have a, uh, an effect as it relates to fair lending and things like that. But ultimately, the, the, the bigger question is just the availability of housing and its availability near where the jobs are. There's not much that we, there's not really nothing that our tools can do. The best thing we can do for, for those issues is to provide an economy where we have stable prices and maximum employment. So uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk, and I'm sure there's been a lot of questions asked on this committee about interest rates. Um, and, uh, and I ask this not to influence you, because I do not believe you should be influenced by political forces. The last thing we would need would be that the worst thing that could happen is if the United States Senate is dictating monetary policy. We'll leave that up to the pros like you. But interest rates continued to be an issue. Um, you, you are fully aware that the debt deal that was struck clawed back um, unspent COVID dollars. Uh, you are familiar that there are some supply chain issues in this country that uh, have impacts on, on, on inflation, as I think the COVID money will have... Uh, have some impacts and, and there's some other things out there that I know you're looking at. So I, I'm going to ask you a, a, a question that I'm sure you've been asked already, but what, what's going to be the key determinant as to whether you raise rates or leave them where they're at, or uh, I don't think dropping them would be appropriate, but uh, what are the things you're looking at to, to make those kind of decisions? Well, I, I would say that if, if we see the economy performing about as we expect, then two thirds of the committee really thought it would be appropriate to raise rates a couple of times between now and the end of the year. So what do we expect? We expect continued modest growth. We, we expect you know, continued gradual cooling off of the labor market, gradual better, better alignment of supply and demand. And we expect, uh, you know, we expect inflation to be improving. And so with, with, if all those things happen, we think we're we're, we're within a couple of rate hikes of, of the level we need to get to. We want to get to a level where we're confident that inflation is and, and will continue to move, is, is moving and will continue to move down to 2% over time. That's the, the and not, not a higher level, that level. Uh, and so that's why, we've, that's why we've slowed down here as we think we are getting close to that level. Okay, so let's think out past that. What factors are you going to look at that would determine a lowering in interest rates then? So we don't see that happening anytime soon, and I, the, the test for that uh, is that we're confident that inflation is moving back down to our 2% goal. We want to we have some confidence. So, uh, and I will say in, in the uh, summary of economic projections that my participants and I filed uh, last week, uh, I, I think by the end of next year, by the end of 2024, uh, the median participant did have some rate, rate cuts. But that, that's going to depend on how the, uh, on how the uh, economy performs. And in, inflation has just consistently proven more persistent than we've expected and, and that other forecasters have expected. So it's going to have to await a time when we're confident that inflation is moving down to 2%. So uh, I want to talk about regulation. I know it's been touched on. Uh, Katie Britt touched on it a little bit. Um, um, and I know Michael Barr is, is oversees uh, the Fed's regulation actions, but when we passed 2155, um, the bill to give reg relief to small banks in particular, um, there was there was a, a sentence in there about tailoring, so that even if you had a, com a community bank, a small community bank, if they had a risky portfolio, they could you could regulate them to match that match that risk. In bigger banks, the same thing. Can you tell me uh, what uh, Barr is thinking or what you're advising him when it comes to, because I think we've all agreed, the chairman just said, we, we want to protect community banks. They're not, they're not the problem out there. In fact, they're the ones that provide access to capital for these communities so they can grow and an economy can happen. Can you tell me what your interaction is with Barr when it comes to regulation and where you think he's going? So broadly speaking, when um, when regulations need to be voted on at the Board of Governors, and I'm one of the people who votes, I'm also chair of the committee, so uh, that that's the nature of the interaction. Um, okay. In terms of the what you're really talking about, uh, regulation for smaller institutions, I would say I think it's important that regulation be 
appropriate for uh, an institution's size and risks. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach to regulation, and you know the, the largest institutions need the highest capital standards and 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 uh, the, the the most uh, regulation. And as you get down to community banks, the, the regulation and supervision should reflect their size and risk. I apologize, Mr. Chairman, for running over. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Powell. Thanks, Senator Tester. Um, Senator Kramer of North Dakota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chairman, for for being here. Today, I, I know uh, several of my Republican colleagues have been asking you about Basel III and the potential for uh, some changes, obviously, in capital requirements. It, part, part of, I'm afraid part of what they're trying to do is fix a liquidity crisis at regional banks with a capital fix, which I don't think the two necessarily go hand in hand. In fact, it seems to me, while you've been trying to engineer a soft landing um, and, and now have, have taken a pause, and I'm not, certainly not critical of that. Um, I can't fathom why the Fed would want to raise capital requirements when we, we could be facing a, what's a credit crunch. And uh, I mean, does that make sense to you that in a, in a potential credit crunch with high cost somewhat by higher rates, obviously somewhat by design, that um, it does make sense to, to increase capital requirements for banks and individuals? So I, I think that's always the trade-off, is uh, higher capital means more stable, stronger banks that can last through bigger crises and things like that. But it's, uh, it's a continuum, because that also means slightly less uh, capital being available and higher price of capital. So and, and the, the, the thing with capital requirements is the answer isn't zero and it's not 100. You've got to find the right place. I would also say that the, the capital in the, in the Form of the of the uh, what I've been briefed on is a proposal where the where the big capital increases are really for the largest institutions, and much less so for for institutions that are not among the particularly the eight G sibs. But what what's the motivation for that? I mean, you, you've just articulated the challenge, obviously m better than I did. But what why the big, for example, the big institutions? What's the what's the situation that would require? So we, to your point, we spent many years raising <clears throat> capital and liquidity standards for the largest institutions, and appropriately so. I supported all of that, and and uh, I'm glad that I did. I think it's been warranted, and I think that the banks, the large banks, have competed very successfully with this high capital. And I think you know further increases are going to be on the table. We always thought there would be some further increase at the end of Basel III globally. But I think you know it's going to be on the uh, the, the, the big the increases are going to need to be justified. I'm going to get to another question, but you said something a little earlier that I wanted to get to in response to um, to Senator Tester. Is your interaction with each other confined only to public meetings? Is that not at all? Not, oh, okay. Not at all. No, <laughs> not at all. So you try to persuade each other at the water I, cooler. I, and you know, I talk to all my colleagues yeah. a lot. I can't. I'm not one of those people who can just sit in your office all day. I'm popping up and running around. <laughs> yeah. I'm one of those people. Yeah, so. yeah I see. Okay. Well, it just because in your interaction, it sound, sort of sounded like that. And I used to be in a three-member, com you know, commission not that, that regulated. No, we have very other regular things. meetings yeah. and conversations, yeah. you know, yeah. right through the weekend. We, we talk sure. frequently. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in an... Earlier exchange um, with, I think it was Senator Tillis, um, you, you talked a little bit about digital economy challenges and you're considering some changes to reflect, you know, how quickly individuals can move money. And, and I, I mean, I think a lot of people, people would maintain that while you always need to have the foundation to weather the storm, so to speak, such as SVB, um, you might not even have a storm but for the the fast ability for somebody to spark a, a run, for example, or, or to move money quickly. But you didn't elaborate on what kind of changes you might be considering. Do you have some personal thoughts on it or things that you've been talking about as you're running around talking to each other? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not the biggest expert on, on this, but I, I so... That's two of us. The, the, uh, the thing that's clear is that our existing liquidity requirements, they didn't assume, they didn't take into contemplation at all the idea that you could have a run this fast. And, and so there are things that are embedded in the net stable funding ratio and the liquidity coverage ratio that reflect an understanding of how fast a run happens. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, we, we now learned that, so, so that's why I think there is regula, regulatory response is going to be appropriate here, not just supervisory. In addition, 
you would have thought, and we thought, and, and by the way, this is every bit, the board is every bit as accountable as the San Francisco Fed on this, sure. that supervision could have been much more forward-leaning on, on the liquidity issue than it was. And so we're going to address that, too. Yeah, no, great point, because you know, I've, these guys have heard me use my, um, my soccer referee illustration. If you, if you, don't, if, if you warn the, you know, the offender over and over and over but never throw up a card, um, they just offend worse the next time. Um, and and I, so I think that's an obvious finding, and I would concur with you. But the whole issue of the, the run itself is a, also problematic, while not maybe directly jurisdictional to any one regulator. As policymakers and and uh, regulators together, we should we should find a better solution. But I th thank you again for your service and for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Senator Warren from Massachusetts is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in 2010, Congress passed Dodd Frank to make banking regulations tougher and to avoid future bank collapses. And very soon after that, bank CEOs started lobbying for weaker rules. Now, Chair Powell, you also lobbied for weaker rules. When President Trump first nominated you as Fed chair in 2017, you testified, actually in this very room, I think, that you intended to, quote, consider appropriate ways to ease regulatory burdens for the banks. And when I asked you if there were any rules, any rules at all, that you thought ought to be made stronger, do, do you remember what you said? I think I pointed to the net stable funding ratio. No, actually, that's not what you said. You said, honestly, Senator, I think they're tough enough. You couldn't point to anything you thought should be tougher. In 2018... In, in the event we strengthened the net stable funding. Well, yeah. in 2018, you supported Congress's weakening of those rules. You led the Fed in hacking away at one rule after another. According to the Fed's own analysis of the Silicon Valley bank failure, you weakened the rules in multiple ways. You reduced capital requirements. You weakened liquidity risk management. You skipped out on using enhanced stress testing for banks with tens of billions of dollars in assets and more. And the result was that the second, third, and fourth largest bank <clears throat> failures in U.S. history, which together required $23 billion in bailout money. In fact, you now hold the record. In a single year, the FDIC has been forced to rescue more giant failed banks on your watch than any Fed chair in American history. Chair Powell, do you agree with Vice Chair Barr's conclusion that the Fed bears a big share of the responsibility for the failure of SVB? I, think, I certainly think that our supervision um, has been shown to have been lax in not being assertive enough. I think that the supervisors saw the right issues and, and, but weren't forceful enough in hindsight. Um, I, and I think I, I, that's certainly a fair conclusion. Okay. So those regulations were weakened. Those supervisors were clearly asleep at the switch for more than five years under your watch. And I'll just say it again. This is exactly why I opposed your nomination in 2017. The decisions that you made, the votes that you took, and the things that you said helped caused this mess. And when you were up for reappointment in 2021, I opposed your confirmation because I believed that your continued leadership would be dangerous to our financial system. And the Fed's own report confirms that. So yesterday, Chair Powell, this committee voted on a bill to help hold CEOs accountable when their actions blow up banks. At the Fed, you are the one who lobbied, who drafted, and who voted for weaker rules, and you were ultimately responsible for the team of Fed supervisors who fell down on the job. Do you take responsibility for your role in these bank failures? So I, th I think we learned some lessons from the, from the bank failures, and I, the main responsibility I take is to learn the right lessons from this and to uh, undertake to, to address them so we don't have a situation like this where we had unexpectedly a, a large bank fail 
and uh, spread contagion into the banking system. That's not supposed to happen, and, and we need to take appropriate steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. So I, I just want to make sure I understand what you mean when you say you take responsibility. Do you take responsibility for your actions that led to the failures of these banks? Yeah, I, I think it's. I think the question of what happened, uh, super supervision was was at fault. That's both at the board and at, at the reserve. And banks. are you ultimately responsible for those supervisors? Are you Actually, in charge under the, here? under the law, the vice chair for supervision. Has, okay, so has you take no authority. responsibility. I didn't on say it. that. Well, that's what I'm trying to ask. That's I'm trying to what understand said. what you take responsibility for. I take responsibility for addressing the situation appropriately. That's, that's talking about that's going forward. Focus. That's my focus. It's yeah. going forward. Yeah, well, that kind of sounds like not taking responsibility for what you've done in the past. You know, a month ago, we had the CEOs of the banks that exploded in here, and each of them had scooped up huge bonuses, and each of them said they planned to keep every penny of that money. And now we have the chair of the Federal Reserve who led the charge to weaken bank regulations, who oversaw the bank supervisors who failed miserably to hold these banks in line. And again, the accountability is zero. Our banking system is broken. $23 billion in bailout money, and there is no accountability for those at the top. And once again, the people who didn't cause the mess are forced to clean it up. We need significant changes here. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Uh, there are two senators that might be online. Senator Sinema is recognized from Arizona if she's online. If not, uh, Senator Warnock from Georgia if he's online. Okay, we'll close the hearing today. We have come together to discuss how the economy ought to be. I don't believe that to have a strong economy, we must trade American jobs for corporate profits, nor do I believe we must sacrifice a safe and resilient banking system for easy money for the biggest banks. We can fight inflation and protect worker gains by investing in growth right here at home and building a more inclusive economy. Uh, thank you for joining us, Chair Powell, today. I look forward to working with you to strengthen our economy. For senators who wish to submit questions, they're due one week from today, Thursday, June 29th. For Chair Powell, please submit responses to questions. Um, for the record, 45 days from the day you receive them. Senator Scott has some comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to be uh, quick, one of the comments that I heard during the uh, hearing was that somehow tax cuts led to the challenges that we're facing with our debt. I just wanted to clarify the record that revenue in 2022 was $4.9 trillion, more than 30% higher than 2017 revenue of $3.32 trillion. One of the things we should just recognize as a clear fact is that if your revenue goes up, and that's what happened after the TCJA in 2018 and 2019, we had an increase in revenue, not a decrease in revenue. Unfortunately, we had an increase in spending that exceeded the increase in revenue. So if you spend more money than you take in, you still end up with a deficit. Thank you. And of course, Senator Scott recognizes that we had a pandemic. Uh, the committee is adjourned. <laughs>